Howdy. Welcome to the Texas A&M University College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs STEM Education Series. For treating minor aches and pains, colds and allergies, even major diseases, prescription and over-the-counter medications can have a profound impact on our lives. And yet, even while swallowing that tiny pill, we rarely consider how it works or who created it and ensures its safety and effectiveness. Today, Dr. Carly Patterson will explain this sometimes mysterious branch of science as she presents pharmacology, the search for the magic pill. Welcome, Dr. Patterson. Good morning, I'm Dr. Carly Patterson. I'm a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Veterinary Physiology and Pharmacology at the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at Texas A&M University. And I'm here today to talk with you a little bit about pharmacology and all of the pieces that go into this branch of science. However, before I get there, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I came into the field of pharmacology and why I think it's so interesting. So just a little bit of background on myself. I am a veterinarian. I am board certified in small animal internal medicine. So what that means is I went to four years of undergraduate education um, for college. I then did four years of veterinary school. And after going through veterinary school and realizing I really liked working with just dogs and cats, I wanted to specialize in working with those two species. And so I embarked on a one-year rotating small animal internship at Texas A&M University. And after I did that internship, I realized I really wanted to focus on internal medicine um, above all other branches of veterinary medicine. And so I did a three-year residency in small animal internal medicine, also fortunately at Texas A&M University in the small animal hospital. And so that doesn't necessarily equal pharmacology. And so after my residency, I realized I really loved teaching the veterinary students, interacting with my fellow colleagues, and also seeing clients. And so I tried to look for a way to put all of those pieces together. And I was fortunate enough to join the Department of Veterinary Physiology and Pharmacology, teaching veterinary pharmacology to second year veterinary students. I also teach physiology in various forms at the undergraduate and at the professional level. And I still manage to teach fourth year veterinary students and see clients um, in the small animal hospital when I'm not teaching um, the second year students. So I did manage to find a way to put all of these pieces together and again, bring my love for internal medicine specifically down to the level of pharmacology where we can really understand how the drugs we use impact our patients, which has always been a really, really fascinating area for me. So again, it's kind of a roundabout way into what we're talking about today. And the bottom line is I want you to realize there are a lot of different paths that you can take into pharmacology. So it doesn't have to be just one set path. There are a lot of different things you can do and you might be surprised at the different ways you can get there. So before we get started with a lot more of the interesting nitty gritty details, we have to start at the beginning. So we'll talk about what exactly is pharmacology? What am I talking about? And so we're dealing with the branch of science that's concerned with the uses, effects, and administration of drugs. So something that we might take for granted on an everyday basis because there are drugs that come in many different forms, whether it's you know, the Tylenol or the Advil or the Motrin that you might have in your pantry or antibiotics that you might take for different types of infections all the way into things like insulin for treatment of diabetes mellitus, um, up into some things that are a little bit harder to talk about, especially when we get into things like chemotherapy for cancer and other more serious life-threatening diseases. So pharmacology encompasses all of those different drugs. And again, there's ways to even specialize further within pharmacology in terms of 
maybe just focusing on the heart and the drugs that affect the heart, focusing on behavior and drugs that affect behavior, um, or again, looking at the complex interactions between one person's genetics and the specific drugs that we might take. So again, a lot of different things, but they all revolve around the study of drugs and really how they impact the body. So again, the study of drugs. And this is a little bit different than what you might think of when you hear the term pharmacist, um, because the pharmacist is really concerned with um, dispensing medications, making sure that there aren't any harmful interactions um, with you know, one patient and multiple different medications versus a pharmacologist who is gonna look at broadly how those drugs interact with different receptors in the body, with different proteins in the body. Um, again, a much broader sense of kind of how the drugs work and what we can do with them rather than a pharmacist who is working on um, specific drugs and dispensing those drugs in a safe manner. So there's a lot of overlap, but again, an important difference that might not be especially apparent unless we bring it up. And again, the study of pharmacology is constantly evolving. So you probably have all seen uh, commercials on TV talking about different drugs and all of the clinical trials or studies that go into making those drugs. And so that's something that's really exciting for you because we have a lot more things that are on the horizon and maybe a lot more promising therapies for diseases that previously we couldn't control very well. So I think, again, that's something to, to really sit back and think about how we can use our knowledge of pharmacology and um, proceed with those you know, advancements into making life better for everybody, whether it's our you know, human patients and colleagues or our um, small animal patients, our large animal patients, you know, zoo animals, everybody benefits when we start applying that knowledge. Okay, so what does a pharmacologist do? And again, this is a, a really broad question that can encompass a number of different things. And so just to give you an example, um, just again, one facet of what a pharmacologist might do would be creating new drugs and evaluating their properties and effectiveness. So that might involve a lot of background research um, to again, figure out what might be the appropriate target because before we can develop new drugs, we have to think, how do I want to impact the body? Or where is there a problem where I might be able to apply a new target, a new therapeutic? Um, again, a lot of lab work, a lot of experimentation, a lot of trial and error goes into this type of research, especially when we're talking about new drugs. And we have to think of, you know, on average, years and years of work before a new drug comes onto the marketplace and before you start seeing those TV commercials touting the benefits. So again, thinking that these drugs don't just come up overnight, it's the result of a lot of hard work between uh, basic scientists, pharmacologists, um, clinicians, patients, all sorts of different people that are involved, but again, the pharmacologist plays a really integral role in saying, I understand the basic mechanisms of this drug, and I understand the physiology of the body, so I can put those two things together and be really creative about coming up with a new therapeutic target. So again, that's just one aspect of what a pharmacologist might do. There are so many other things that they're not limited to just you know research and lab work, um, there's a lot of other things that they can do. Dr. Patterson, we have a couple of questions sure. already. And the first one goes along with this. It, they say, why, or no, excuse me, how do you make sure that the medication does what it's supposed to do before giving it to people? That is a great question. So that's, that's an excellent point to make. How do we know that it's gonna do what it's supposed to do before we start giving it to people? And I think that really touches on this idea of, all of the research that goes into these drugs. So that's a really important safety point is we want to make sure the drugs that we're giving to people actually do what they are supposed to do, what they say they're going to do, and also that they're safe for the people that are taking them. And so that comes down to, again, a lot of the background work and then a lot of different phases in terms of clinical trials to say, first, we have to figure out 
What exactly does this drug do when we give it to people? And then we have to start to establish these safe doses to say, okay, well, if I give the patient, you know, 10 milligrams by mouth, it's going to cause X effect versus, okay, let's look if we gave it gave this person 50 milligrams by mouth, what would happen? And so again, making sure that the drug actually does what it's supposed to do goes into designing a good experiment to say, okay, if I have this change and I give this drug, what ends up happening? And so again, that gets into um, the actual experiment itself, appropriate statistics, which again can be quite complex, and then looking at all of the different desired outcomes. And so again, a lot of background work, a lot of legwork goes into making sure that when we sell a drug or when you know a company sells a drug, that it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. And thinking, just to throw some numbers out there, um, we're talking in the billions of dollars to get a drug from somebody's idea um, into the actual pharmacy because of all that important work behind it. That's great, thank you. And then earlier, um, I believe you mentioned something about toxicology mm -hmm. or not, and they'd like to know what is toxicology? Yeah, so that's a great question. So toxicology is really the uh, branch of science that's in, involved with studying the toxic effects or the harmful effects of various substances. So it doesn't always have to apply to the, you know, harmful effects of a drug, but it could be the harmful effects of certain plants or, you know, substances that animals secrete. So again, a really broad branch of science that says, what are all of these really harmful or bad things that can happen if, you know, we get this substance and it acts in a manner that's harmful to the body. So um, toxicology is really closely aligned with pharmacology because frequently when we're talking about drugs, we say, here's the safe dose or the label dose. And if we get into maybe higher doses, we could have um, toxicity issues where too much of that drug leads to really harmful effects that we might see you know, on the heart, on the kidneys, on the brain, all sorts of things. So um, again, thinking about the, the harmful effects and also realizing that we could be dealing with some common substances and that might be toxic to one particular species, but not toxic to another. So a great example of that would be um, xylitol, which you're probably all saying, what the heck is that? But it's actually a common uh, sweetener that's found in your chewing gum. So if you open a pack of gum, you know, looking in your backpack, you'll probably see xylitol listed on the ingredients. And so it's safe for us as humans to have that in our gum or candy products. Um, but if we give it to dogs, it actually is toxic and really hurts their liver. So again, thinking about toxicology is something that really examines the harmful effects of a substance, um, but it's not something that's universal to you know, every substance that we have on earth because it can be very different. So good question. Okay, so looking again at some more things related to careers in pharmacology. So this is a, a pie graph from Johns Hopkins University, just breaking down some of the current careers of people that have advanced degrees in pharmacology. So you can see there's a number of different people that are involved in industry. So working for different drug companies and trying to develop those new drugs and those new therapeutic targets. Um, there's a number of people that are also involved at the postdoctoral level. So they've gotten maybe a PhD in pharmacology and now they're doing additional work in a laboratory to gain more research experience. And that's what a postdoc means. So again, a lot of involvement in research, whether it's with a specific drug company, whether maybe it's a specific research lab or an academic university like Texas A&M, um, looking to develop you know, really innovative therapies. Um, and again, there's all sorts of different things that people can do with pharmacology, whether it's teaching, like what I do, whether it's in government and helping to craft new policies related to drugs and, again, uh, careful considerations. Um, maybe it's consulting with different doctors and hospitals and big drug companies. Um, again, there's a lot of different things that you can do with pharmacology. 
Okay, so then thinking about, again, pharmacology and the science behind it or how it relates to science, um, this is what really excites me a lot about pharmacology because it has a number of different um, branches within a lot of different foundational sciences. So we think about um, biology, we think about chemistry, I think a really important one is physiology. So that's just the study of how things work in the body. A lot of the times you might see anatomy, that's you know all the different anatomic features of the body. So you know different veins and nerves and chambers in the heart and all of those really important structural considerations. That's the field of anatomy. And then we have physiology, which is how do all of those things work? How does the heart pump the way it does? How does it get the signal to start pumping? How do we have this relationship um, between all of these different organ systems that make our bodies work every day? Um, so that's something where a really you know, strong background in physiology of you know, why do these things work the way they do um, helps um, strengthen your knowledge in pharmacology. And when I'm teaching the veterinary students about pharmacology, I always like to remind them that pharmacology is really just applied physiology. So if you have a hard time understanding all of the different mechanisms or you don't at, like asking why things work, um, then maybe pharmacology is, is not gonna be your favorite subject um, just because again, those two fields are really closely aligned and you can do a lot of different things with them. So um, again, those two are, are really closely related we ha also have immunology, so the immune system, um, and then certainly pathology, and that's really the study of when things go wrong, when we don't have that normal physiology anymore, we have something um, that's abnormal, that's pathology. So a lot of the times, you know, we can use pharmacology, sometimes toxicology, um, to help pull all these things together and really illustrate um, a very complex process. Okay, so now that we've talked just a little bit about pharmacology and what it entails, um, let's just talk a little bit about how you become a pharmacologist. Because like I've said, there's a number of different things that you can do with an advanced degree um, specific to pharmacology, but how do you actually get there? So thinking about that, um, certainly, again, this goes back to your um, studies in college, so talking about a Bachelor of Science degree in any kind of pre-pharmacy or related field. So there's not a pre-pharmacology per se like you might think of with pre-medicine or pre-dental or pre-veterinary medicine, anything like that. Um, because again, we have to encompass all of those important fields relating to biomedical science. So again, a strong background in chemistry, certainly in physiology would be really, really helpful. Um, anatomy also, again, providing a basic framework of what goes into the body, how is it made, um, and then thinking of things like organic chemistry that you know is always something that seems really daunting, but again, seeing how things work on a molecular level and then building that up into the body system level is going to be really important when we're talking about the study of pharmacology because we have to think about all of those different levels sometimes at one time. And then um, further specialization if you're saying I really want to focus on becoming a pharmacologist and um, then you can think about graduate or professional education um, towards maybe a more specific branch of pharmacology. So um, certainly a doctoral degree, so something like a PhD in pharmacology. Um, for me as an example, I did my training in veterinary medicine, so I have a doctor of veterinary medicine, um, but there are ways that you can actually go and specialize in a um, field of clinical pharmacology as a veterinarian. So we do have veterinarians who are um, further specialized into clinical pharmacologists and they can really help us again with looking at the different drugs available to our um, animal species and, and whatnot. So again, 
Doctor of Pharmacy is going to be, again, relating back to um, specifically a pharmacist and helping people with dispensing medications, understanding um, the important interactions that might exist, and really being the medication expert. So it might prepare you to, again, go on and get more training as far as um, the pharmacology field, but again, a pharmacist and a pharmacologist are not the same thing. A lot of overlap and a lot of you know, great understanding between the two fields. Again, there are slight differences, so it is helpful to think about those things. If you say, I would really love to go and be able to work with people all day, talk with them about their medications, um, you know, provide them a place to ask questions and make sure that they understand why they're taking these medications and how they might um, impact their body. Um, that would be more of what a pharmacist does versus if you say, I really want to go and ask some more questions about how we might improve um, the management of these specific diseases or, you know, develop some new drugs or, um, again, kind of work in a broader sense, really studying how the drugs interact um, at the body level. So again, just some slight differences there between a pharmacologist and a pharmacist, and again, a lot of great overlap. Okay, so we've talked, you know, a little bit about all of the different things that people can do with a pharmacology career, but gen then just thinking broadly, we're talking about the study of drugs, so how do these drugs work? So um, drugs actually bind to a target receptor site. So um, we have a nice little graphic here that helps illustrate um, some properties of different drugs because we frequently talk about them in terms of whether they are um, an antagonist, which means they might fill that receptor site like in um, panel C there with the little red um, triangle occupying that receptor site. So that drug, um, that little red triangle would be the drug and it would be blocking that specific neurotransmitter, so that big yellow Pac-Man guy, um, to say, okay, I'm giving this drug and maybe there's something you know, that's going wrong with the specific neurotransmitter so I wanna block it and so giving that little red drug might help to block this neurotransmitter and help improve the quality of life depending on the disease. And we have other drugs that can act in an opposite fast fashion, so drugs that are agonists, so they actually mimic the function of the neurotransmitter. So we might say, okay, that little blue um, drug right there that's listed in panel B will mimic a neurotransmitter and bind and then can you know, mimic the function of that neurotransmitter so that the desired effect happens. And again, it really goes into an, a deep understanding of what the disease process is to say, I need to block this function with an antagonist drug or I need to actually encourage more of this function with an agonist type, type drug. So, and again, there's a lot of, um, different ways that drugs can act, um, more so than necessarily just agonists or antagonists. Um, so this is just, again, a foundation of what drugs are capable of doing and how we might use them, again, to target certain diseases. Okay, we have a few more questions here, mm -hmm. um, and it's all kind of about how you make sure these drugs are working the way they should. Mm -hmm. And they wanna know, first of all, are drugs always tested on animals before people receive them? So that's a really good question, and I would say it, it kind of depends. Um, some drugs are tested on animals, and it, uh, it usually depends on you know, how similar the animals are to people, because um, Again, some drugs are gonna lend themselves to that better than others, and there's a certain safety profile that we have to achieve before we test all of those drugs on humans. And sometimes that actually turns out to say, you know, maybe there's a drug that we're wanting to develop for people, and maybe we test it in mice first, and that's great, and we can see how it helps the mice, um, and then we have to go and test it in people. Sometimes, though, we might find that there's a particular drug that seems really promising for humans um, and they've tested it in a different species of animal and find that it doesn't actually work for the humans, but it really works well for the animals. So our, there are some drugs that we have available in veterinary medicine um, that work really well for maybe our dog patients that were actually initially de um, developed for human patients. They just 
it actually didn't help the humans that much, they helped the dogs. So, um, so it's hard to say that they're all tested on animals beforehand because it really depends on the drug and it depends on what question we're trying to answer. The other thing is um, the scientists are very, very concerned about testing things in animals because obviously we don't want to test things in animals if we don't have to and so there's a lot of really strict criteria as far as designing experiments and making sure that um, again what we're testing is really necessary um, for the humans and we use a specific population of animals so again a very very broad question and that's hard to answer with just one yes or no right and then they'd like to know if a medication is proven to be effective in animals, why then can it only be used in humans or vice versa? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. And that's something when we talk about veterinary medicine and the drugs that we give our animals, um, there are a lot of similarities. So there are a lot of human medications that we will use in animals because they still work. Um, and again, that goes back to a little bit of the toxicology of things where some drugs, you know, for example, if you have a stomach upset and you're taking Pepsid AC, um, that is a drug that we use in humans and it's a drug that we also use in animals. Something else like Benadryl, you know, we can use it in humans and we can use it in animals. Um, and again, a lot of this depends on how the drug is going to impact um, our animal species and our human colleagues. So, um, so there is a lot of overlap with some drugs that we can use in animals and then also use in people. Um, there's some that we can't. So a great example would be something like acetaminophen or ibuprofen. So um, talking about Tylenol or Motrin or Advil. So those drugs are all you know, safe for use in, in humans when, when they're used appropriately, but they're not safe for use in animals. So again, there's a lot of very sophisticated mechanisms happening in our animal patients and in our human patients and it becomes a lot of, again, trial and error and seeing what works and what doesn't to say one thing works well for humans um, and also works well for animals or you know, vice versa. So um, again, that's why it's such an exciting field because there's still a lot that we don't necessarily know and a lot that's coming out within you know, the last 10 years or so to say we have a lot more understanding about these things. All right, all right. So good questions, those are excellent things to think about. And again, just all the more opportunity within the field of pharmacology. So getting to a subject that is really near and dear to my heart is pharmacology and veterinary medicine. So again, I think this is a really, really fascinating field. There are so many things that we have discovered recently and there's so many things that are kind of out there and waiting to be you know, found that could really impact how we treat our dogs and our cats and our cattle and our horses and sheep and birds and, and you name the species, um, there's gonna be an impact with pharmacology. So again, thinking about our um, animal friends and, uh, and pharmacology, we think about, again, the uses, effects, and administration of drugs in our animals. So we study drugs and how they impact our animals just like we study those drugs in humans. And again, um, there's a lot of differences, but there also are a lot of similarities. So a really important point, um, just like you would go to the pharmacist to get a prescription filled, um, we as licensed veterinarians also must authorize um, the drugs that we dispense to our animals. And so again, that's something where we really take heart as to what is going on with our patient and think carefully about the best plan before we start prescribing medications. Because as a lot of you have very astutely picked up on, um, you know, we can have some harmful effects from drugs. Not every drug is gonna be great for every single patient. Um, and that's just the beauty of individualized um, patient responses because we can have a lot of variation. So when we're talking about identifying medication, we have to first think what is our underlying diagnosis because I can't just go prescribing a bunch of medications to a dog if I don't know what I'm actually treating. So that's another thing we really emphasize with our students um, in the veterinary curriculum to say it's really important to understand you know, how we come up with the ultimate diagnosis and then making a really rational 
um, pharmaceutical plan after that point. So again, a lot of thought goes into it before we actually get to the point of writing a prescription. Um, one way that we teach the students about different drugs and how we use them is by classifying them. So there are certain drugs that fall into broad categories. So again, you know, chemotherapy drugs would be their own classifications. Um, drugs to help prevent vomiting when animals feel ill, that would be another different classification. Um, drugs to help in heart failure, that would be, again, another example of a classification of a drug. And so, and again, it goes back to understanding why this animal is sick, what is the ultimate diagnosis, and what are we trying to do with our pharmaceuticals to help this animal feel better. So a lot of thought that has to go into the you know, understanding of the disease before we can actually prescribe it. Another really big important consideration that sometimes can get overlooked is the form of the drug. So again, this is something that we emphasize with our students to think, okay, some drugs only are injectable, meaning we have to give them intravenously into the vein. Maybe you've seen um, people give animals injections um, into the skin, which we call subcutaneous, so um, just under the skin. Um, some drugs we can give by mouth, but we have to always think what is the most practical because as, as a pet owner myself, I'm not going to be able to give injectable medications to my cat um, because again, it's just not feasible and it's not safe, and so we have to think about um, what kind of oral medications can we give to our patients going home versus patients in hospital that are really sick and not eating? Maybe ne they need something injectable because they're not going to be able to tolerate it, you know, going into their mouth and down their esophagus. So again, a lot of different formulations that are available for a particular drug, which is great. Um, but again, it comes back to what is the underlying problem? What is the diagnosis? And what is our goal? Um, and again, thinking about the actual route of administration that goes into the form of the drug because certain drugs, again, have to be only given um, intravenously. Some drugs can only be given by mouth. Um, again, the route of administration plays a big role, especially when we're asking people to, um, you know, give these drugs to their animals at home when it can be really difficult to do. So lots of really important considerations. And so I thought I would kind of branch off a little bit and give you some examples of um, animals and pharmacology and just, you know, a number of different things that are relevant to the field of veterinary medicine and then also to the field of human medicine. So one really exciting thing that I've touched on very briefly is this idea of individualized medicine. So people had asked, you know, how do you know that a drug is going to work in that specific patient? And I think that gets to a bigger question of saying, you know, again, how do we know that this drug is actually going to do what we say it's going to do? Because not every dog and not every human reacts the same way. And what we've um, been able to do in veterinary medicine is actually get to the bottom of some different gene mutations that can help us predict some animals that might not respond well and have toxic effects of certain medications that might be safe in other um, animals. So one good example of this is um, uh, the MDR mutation or ABCB mutation um, that's present in some herding breeds. So collies, Australian shepherds, just some breeds that could be affected. And what we can do, there's actually um, a pharmacologist, a veterinary pharmacologist who developed a gene test to say um, whether certain drugs would be safe or not for these dogs based on their underlying genetic makeup. So that's been really life-saving for certain um, dog patients of ours to say, well, you know what? This medication isn't going to be safe, even though it's safe for you know, a Labrador retriever, um, just because we ap actually happen to know that this dog has a genetic mutation and they will not tolerate that drug. So that's been a really exciting advancement and we're adding more drugs to the list every day of um, certain medications that some breeds cannot tolerate. So again, something that they do in human medicine when they're looking at different drugs um, to see whether they're actually gonna work in a patient population is again, um, go down to the genetics and the, really the molecular level to say um, this drug is going to impact these people with this you know, certain ability to metabolize it. Um, so they'll be able to be um, 
may be more affected by this drug versus some people that don't have that specific gene or don't metabolize it in that way, and so maybe this drug won't help them as much. So that's a big thing that, again, has impacted uh, human health as far as how we prescribe drugs, and now it's trickling down into veterinary medicine where we've had really big advancements in being able to um, really tailor our treatment plans to our patients. So again, very, very exciting. Um, and it is a, a commercially available test that um, owners can request and say, I'm really concerned, I wanna test my dog and we're able to do it. So um, just another example, when uh, we had a question asking about testing um, drugs in animals, and this was a, a little bit, um, you know, kind of different in terms of testing the drug in animals because it was really more about the drug discovery. Um, but when we're talking specifically about insulin or medication to help lower um, high blood sugars, so people that have diabetes um, or animals that have diabetes, again, their blood sugar can get really, really high and it can actually lead to life-threatening consequences. Um, and so we have insulin, which is released from the pancreas to help decrease blood sugar and help people and animals um, live relatively normal lives. But um, discovering insulin was something um, that actually happened um, about 100 years ago, and it was a team of a, a young researcher and a, a young assistant, and they actually isolated the insulin um, from the pancreas of dogs and then realized that if they injected it into diabetic dogs that they could get their blood sugar to come down and that they could um, make them feel better and they could live longer. So um, that was something where, again, um, dogs were used to kind of figure this out. They actually then tested that insulin into a diabetic young man who um, was very, very ill, um, and this actually saved his life. So again, animals play a big role when we're talking about pharmacology, and this was a discovery that benefited humans, but it also benefited dogs and cats because we use insulin today to help manage diabetes. So again, really good example of um, you know, the collaboration between the two species. Um, and then just another example, again, thinking about um, animals and pharmacology and what they've done to help us humans. Um, the Gila monster, which might be an animal that you don't want to encounter on an everyday basis. Um, I know I would be a little afraid if I saw this guy coming down the street. Um, but they've actually discovered, again, using a lot of background research, a lot of trial and error, um, that a drug, Bietta, so that's the, um, the trademark name that you see there. Um, and this is a drug that's actually really, really exciting because it helps people with type 2 diabetes maintain normal blood glucose concentrations. And so it's not insulin, um, but it's actually a medication that stimulates the body to release its own insulin. And so that's why, again, it's specific to type 2 diabetes, which is beyond the scope of where we're going to talk um, today. Um, but again, a really exciting, a new class of medication. So again, thinking that we're maybe just limited to insulin and a lot of other modifications to help people with diabetes. And now we have this brand new class and a whole new way of approaching this disease um, that can really help people to um, live longer, healthier lives. And I know it's something that we're looking at in veterinary medicine to help some of our type two um, diabetic patients. Um, so again, really exciting things that, again, are coming from animals to help drive new discoveries in the human medical field. Okay, so, and again, just thinking about pharmacology and human medicine, and like I said before, it's really constantly evolving to address, you know, whether drugs are effective or not. That's a huge um, concern that we have when we're developing new drugs because we want them to work and we want them to be safe for the people that are having to take them sometimes every day. Um, we also have to be really mindful of abuse of certain drugs um, because, again, we're concerned with making people feel better, helping them live longer lives, and so we want to minimize any potential for taking a drug that could be used in a really good way um, as far as people who might want to use it for another 
um, you know, way that's abusing the actual potential of that drug. And so again, something that comes up and is a really big concern throughout the news is um, pain medication. So that would be an example of medications that are used to help decrease pain. Um, so a really uh, a good therapeutic goal, and we don't want people to use those um, for something else and really divert them from their uh, original intention. So again, a lot of things that pharmacologists have to be mindful of and especially aware of um, when developing drugs and talking about how to regulate them and make them safe for the people who take them. Um, again, also addressing the potential for environmental pollutants because again, we're talking about um, the potential for toxicology and how you know, different remnants can affect their environment and what we can do to help combat that. We have another question here. All right. And they want to know, are there acceptable levels of side effects when developing medications? So that's a really great question. Um, and so that's something if you're thinking about the potential side effects of a medication, um, I would say every drug has some sort of side effect. No drug is perfect and you know, completely harmless because, again, that would mean it's probably not doing anything if it doesn't cause any side effects. Now, to back up a little bit and clarify what I'm just said, um, most of the side effects that we would deem acceptable would probably fall into the range of, you know, some stomach upset, maybe slight changes that could be a little bit annoying, but they're not going to be overall hazardous to your health. So, yes, there are um, certain side effects as far as the, the number and the magnitude that we take into account to say, okay, well, the drug is, is awesome and it really helps to shrink this tumor, um, but people you know, might lose some of their hair or they might feel a little bit sick. And so again, that's some of the things that we think about commonly with the, the chemotherapy drugs, just as an example, um, where they're doing great work, but they do cause um, some side effects that we might see in our human patients. And so again, that's something when designing drugs, we take that into account to say, okay, well, this drug, maybe it's really great and it you know, shrinks this tumor, but then people are really, really sick and um, you know, it's really actually life-threatening how um, you know, maybe their um, red blood cells get too low or something like that. So again, that would be saying, okay, well, that type of side effect really isn't acceptable because we above all wanna do no harm. We want to make sure that our patients feel better. So there is always some degree of uh, you know, a side effect that we have to be okay with, and it really goes into weighing the pros and the cons of a particular medication for a particular diagnosis. And so again, a lot of legwork, a lot of background goes into making this plan before we select um, a drug, but that's an excellent question. Thank you. All right, so. Um, so again, getting towards the end of the, the few points here, thinking about some of the current research at Texas A&M University, and again, it's impossible to capture it all on just one slide because there are so many things that are being done um, that involve pharmacology, but again, have so many other pieces um, that it's hard to just pull them all out into one particular slide. But some examples of current research would be um, certainly trying to figure out the optimal dose for a particular patient population, so establishing dose-response relationships, um, looking at the pharmacokinetic analysis of drugs and species. So really the pharmacokinetics of just basically what does the drug do in the body? So that's a very simplistic way of understanding pharmacokinetics. Um, but again, if we're talking about maybe a dog versus a cat, they don't necessarily handle the drug the same way, and so we have to get an understanding of the pharmacokinetics before we can say, here's a great idea as far as maybe the optimal dose for this particular um, species. So again, the pharmacokinetic analyses are done um, all across the university um, and involve a number of different drugs and a number of different species and are responsible for, again, a lot of that foundational work. And then clinical trials, those are extremely important, especially getting back to that very first question about how do we know that a drug is actually effective. Um, we have to do clinical trials to say, okay, we have patients that have this disease and some of them are gonna get the drug and maybe some of them 
get an older drug or maybe they don't get any drug at all, depending on the underlying disease process, whether it's safe or not to do that, um, to see you know, whether the patients getting the new drug get better compared to the people that got an older drug or maybe no drug at all. So again, those are really, really important in, in making sure that we have new therapies that are effective and also safe. But again, a lot of background work and a lot of legwork goes into um, the understanding of that drug before we would actually ever even get to a clinical trial. So um, those are really, really exciting and can provide a lot of new information. Um, and again, it's just the sky's the limit when we're talking about where we can go within this field. Um, so with that, I'm happy to entertain any more questions that may have arisen. I think that um, we've answered all our questions throughout our program today and we're about out of time but um, we really appreciate this very interesting presentation and the scope of impact of pharmacology on both people and animals and all the different career options this has been really interesting and I hope our students um, have developed a new understanding and appreciation for pharmacology and maybe inspired some of you to pursue this great field if you'd like to learn more about STEM or veterinary science related materials, we encourage you to visit our website at peer.tamu.edu and you can find lesson plans, videos, activities, all kinds of things to further your education in these fields. And we look forward to seeing you next week when Dr. Gastel will present science and ethics and case studies that will see what would you do in such situations. So thank you again for being here today and we look forward to seeing you next time.